Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our Pediatric Melanoma Summit live panel discussion. My name is Kylie Lapira. I'm the CEO of the Melanoma Research Foundation and really thrilled to be with you for this really exciting talk tonight with experts in the pediatric melanoma field. Um, we are going to give the opportunity for you all to ask questions. We recorded many informative sessions this week, which you can view at melanoma.org, and we'll show you that URL um, in a second here. Um, but again, this panel discussion is really about you asking questions to our experts and really um, having the information that you all need um, as parents to make really great treatment decisions for your children. So we're excited to have you all here tonight. Um, we are going to, again, start off with a few questions for our experts who I'll introduce in a moment. And then again, you all have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A chat function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. This discussion will also be recorded and posted on the MRF page. And again, we'll show that link to you so you can see exactly where to find them on melanoma.org. I would also like to thank our sponsors. So these are the financial sponsors who generously and our in-kind sponsors as well, who provided all of the amazing goodie bags, the welcome kits for our kiddos this week. We're so great for a partnership and really helping us advance our mission. And really, again, it's been a tough little goodie bag in the mail is always really fun. So we're, we're very appreciative of their support. So with that, I'm gonna start by introducing our panelists um, and then we will go into some questions. So first, Would you like me to introduce myself? Hi, uh, my name is Alvaro Papo. I'm a pediatric oncologist. I'm the head of the Division of Solid Tumors at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. I'm the co-leader of the Developmental Biology and Solid Tumor Program at St. Jude. My main areas of interest are pediatric cancers and sarcomas, and I've had an interest in uh, pediatric melanoma since 1991. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Hi, my name is Robin Garris. I am one of the pediatric dermatologists at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm one of the co-founding members of our pediatric melanoma group, and I'm really excited to be part of this virtual summit today. So thank you for having me. It seems that our moderator might be having some connection problems, so I wonder if we should just go into some of the pre-recorded questions, if Dr. Papo wants to start. Sure. Um, I, let me see if I can pull up the questions. Uh, I, I know that well, I, I can also, I'd be happy to start with mine if you like, it'll give you a minute. Let, let me see, I'm pretty sure that I um, had, had them over here, uh, here it is. Okay, Liana, live agenda. Okay, the first question is, um, in the study about pembrolizumab, you discussed the numbers in 
relapse-free survival after taking this drug? Do you see a market for this in pediatric melanoma space? And do you think it would have the same impact on children as it did in adults? So that's a very good question. So I think that the study of Egermont, and there's also an, another study with nivolumab, have definitely shown that adjuvant immunotherapy with a checkpoint inhibitor, with a PD-1 inhibitor, prolongs the relapse-free survival of patients who have node positive melanoma. So the important things to remember, we've talked about this, is that you should be talking about a conventional melanoma, a melanoma that resembles all the characteristics of adult melanoma. We do not have any information on what we call spitz melanoma or spitzoid melanomas, or in melanomas that are seen in very young patients. We also have very, very limited data on the use of checkpoint inhibitors in patients that have the so-called congenital melanomas, those melanomas that arise in a very giant nevus, usually in the body. The preliminary data that we have, at least from congenital melanomas, is that checkpoint inhibitors do not appear to be particularly effective. As far as the activity of these agents in older patients, adolescents, who have the same clinical characteristics or genomic characteristics as the adult melanoma are also very limited. So to give you an example, there was a study in which they used pembrolizumab, which is the agent that is depicted here, in patients with recurrent uh, tumors, including melanoma. In that study, there were only eight patients with melanoma. And at least in that study, there's no mention of significant responses. In another study by Dr. Crystal Mackel, in which they used nivolumab, in that study, there was only one patient with melanoma and no responses were seen. However, I think that in clinical practice, if we had a patient who meets all of the criteria for the diagnosis of conventional melanoma and had what we call stage three disease with tumor deposits more than one millimeter in a node, I think that we would recommend giving pembrolizumab in the adjuvant setting based on the very compelling data that has been shown to be active in adults. Thank you, Dr. Papo. I'm back. I was having some technical issues. I don't know what happened. Uh, but thank you for, for jumping in there with the first question. Um, we also had Dr. Vern Sondek join us. Um, so I'm just going to give a little brief introduction for Dr. Sondek and then jump back into the questions. So Dr. Vernon Sondek is at the Moffitt Cancer Center. He is the chair of the Department of Cutaneous Oncology and director of surgical education. So we're going to be hearing from him momentarily. Um, Dr. Papo, just to follow up on the research side of things, because you're talking about, again, more of the, the research. Can you talk about, you know, the discovery of the MAP3KA gene and what are the next steps in researching this mutation and potential resistance to therapies and how they affect pediatric melanoma patients? Yeah, so this was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the pre-recorded session, this was actually, it all started with an index patient that was referred to us when the diagnosis actually of Spitz melanoma, but he had a lot of very bad features, including a mutation in a gene called TERT. We talked about that in the, in the, in the talk that appears to, to give you a very high incidence of relapse in Spitz melanomas. And after multiple relapses, he, we were able to do what we call comprehensive genomic analysis so we did analysis of all of the genes using whole genome sequencing. We also looked at all of the exons and also looked at the potential for translocations between genes. And what we found that there was a new combination of gene, what we call rearrangements, where one gene comes together with the other, involving a gene called MAP3. <laughs> Interestingly, this gene is also known as CUT1 and is a gene that has been described to be responsible for some of the resistance that is seen in adult patients who receive therapy for the treatment of melanoma who have a BRAF mutation. So we did some preclinical studies to see if this fusion actually activated the pathway that you normally see in patients that have, for example, BRAF mutations, and it does. And then we extended these observations to 49 patients. We were able to get samples from 49 patients with a variety of different spitz lesions and spitz melanomas. And we found that about a third of them have actually MAP3K8 alterations, either a gene rearrangement or a truncation of the genes. That means that there's something in the gene that stops it and it cannot transcribe what it's supposed to do. 
And interestingly, in all of these cases, the last portion of the gene, the last exon, which is number nine, was missing. And the reason why that is important is because that is the part of the gene that basically makes the gene turn off. So if you don't have that, you have a constant activation of that. We then proceeded to do preclinical studies and found that actually this rearrangement activates this MAP kinase pathway. And we're currently doing some studies to see if some of the commonly used agents to treat BRAF mutant melanoma, like trametinib or MEK inhibitor, I'm sorry, like, like uh, Vemurafenib or Dabrafenib, or MEK inhibitors like trametinib are effective in this subset of patients with Spitz melanoma. But at least based on the preclinical data, we would assume that it would act. Uh, uh, also on the index patient, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this patient was treated with trametinib and he had a very transient response. And he was also treated with an ERK inhibitor called oxirletinib. I mean, it's like playing Scrabble with these agents, but okay, oxirletinib and he uh, had also a very transient response. So I think that there is evidence to suggest that this specific mutation will respond you know, either transiently, at least transiently to some of the currently available MEK and ERK inhibitors. Great, thank you. That sounds that sounds promising in the field of research for our patients. Thank you. So um, now let's move over to Dr. Sondek. Um, you know, specifically in your talk, you you touched on biopsies and pathology reports, and you've done this in the past as well in person at our Pete Summit, which is very helpful. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of questions around pathology in particular. And the question for you is, can parents request specific pathologists to review their biopsies or, or give them their bio, the uh, pathology report? Or does it have to be completed at the institution that they're being treated at? So the pathologist has to send everything to another pathologist for a second opinion. In general, uh, when, when biopsies are done with children, if there's any equivocal feature or anything that seems out of the ordinary, uh, most pathologists are only too happy to send it for another opinion. Um, in practice, most pathologists have a pattern already. They know somebody or they know of someone that they'll send the cases to. Um, but I don't think that um, if somebody said, I, I want you to send it to so-and-so, that the uh, doctors wouldn't be receptive to that potentially. But remember, uh, it can really pretty much only be sent to one person at a time. And each time it's sent somewhere, there's a time period that is uh, required. Somebody has to get the slides together, mail them off. They have to be received and looked at and sent back before they can go to another uh, center. So it is a, uh, a process that takes some time. It's often a process that the pathologist starts before they, the family ever even knows what the biopsy showed. So I would say if, um, if a, a family has a child the biopsy was, you know, they start hearing that, gee, it's taking a long time. How come I haven't heard back? I thought I'd hear in a few days. They can contact their doctor, and they may well find it's already been sent out for another opinion. If they first thing they hear is from their doctor who says, well, they sent this out, and there's a lot of question about it, the family should get as much information as they can and if there's any doubt, they should ask for another opinion and they can uh, at that point say, well, you sent it to this person. I want you to send it to somebody else for a second opinion. Although much of the time, and this was the point we made, we don't want to rely just on the ivory tower. When you send the slides off to somebody, you can go to five different people and they can give five different answers. Um, and so there is 
uh, often more benefit in getting a complete opinion than just having the biopsy keep going to different doctors. Because in the end, if you get three different opinions, which one do you believe? The one that you like? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the right one. It's the one that's correct. And none of them may be as accurate as they could be if it was a comprehensive evaluation of the child. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sondek. Um, just a, qu a quick sort of follow up to that. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about diagnostic tools as well. And DermTech, um, who's also partnered with the MRF uh, this year, has a diagnostic tool, non-invasive diagnostic tool that's that um, is used in adult cutaneous dermatology. And again, this is something that is non-invasive. Is this, could this be applicable to, um, to pediatric melanoma so children don't have to get invasive biopsies? Uh, the short answer is we don't know. There's no uh, expertise. The longer answer is a, this is a problem that we see with every kind of diagnostic test that is um, developed for adults in clear-cut cases. They take unequivocal melanomas in an adult. Nobody is doubting it because they're already, the patient has already shown widespread metastatic disease, so we know it's melanoma. They take a pure, absolutely certain benign mole that nobody doubted it didn't have a single bad feature and the person was fine and they compare those two and say 80 percent of the time that this test can tell the difference between something that killed the person and something that was a totally benign mold that not a single person in the world would worry about well if our pathologists were only right 80 percent of the time boy would we be in trouble so imagine now we take that 80% accurate test and use it in a case where the pathologist don't have agreement or aren't sure, now we have no idea whether the information it's giving us is right or wrong. So just like for so many other things, even up to and including a surgical procedure like a sentinel node biopsy, no one piece of information by itself is definitive. It, there are some times when additional information in the context of the right history, getting all the information about the patient and looking at it under the microscope and doing every kind of molecular test and fingerprinting like Dr. Papo was talking about, that there are some things that help us and some things that leave us with more questions. Um, we would Love to see an evaluation of that particular derm tech um, um, non-invasive test in childhood lesions, but until that's done, we really don't have any idea whether it would be a value. And of course, it's not useful once the mole's gone. It's only useful when it is applied directly to the surface of the mole and before any biopsy is carried out. Um, and we only really have information based on adults about that. Great, thank you. So more, more data needed, obviously, in terms of the PEATS population. Um, that's very helpful. Uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and go over to Dr. Garris to talk a little bit about her talk where she touched on the different ABCDEs of pediatric melanoma versus adult melanoma. And one of the questions that we had from our, our parents was, you know, what kind of education should parents be providing their pediatricians, um, you know, in terms of the ABCDEs? And since they're really the ones interacting with them and the pediatricians are often the ones who really first see the spot in question. So what kind of advice would you give to parents out there? So I think that's a really good question. Um, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so, you know, I think the point that we're talking about here is that the traditional ABCDEs that we use for adult melanoma may not pick up a pediatric melanoma. And we talked about how in kids, 
sometimes atypical moles, like atypical spitz nevi, or even spitzoid melanomas or true amelanotic melanomas may be red. They may not be multicolored. They might have perfectly normal borders and only have one color and that color may be red. So I think, you know, it's sad that we have to ask the parents to educate the pediatricians, but I think um, pediatric dermatologists and the pediatric melanoma specialists, it's our job also to educate the pediatricians. And frankly, in some communities, also family practitioners, physician assistants, or even nurse practitioners, so those physician extenders. Um, and I know at our institution, we give, whenever we have the opportunity, we give a talk to the pediatricians. In fact, I think we have one coming up in a couple of months, just about this very fact that um, it's sort of a fallacy that moles have to be multicolored to be worrisome. Um, one thing that I really like to provide to patients, and pediatricians can access this too for free, is on the Society for Pediatric Dermatology website. If you um, Google Society for Pediatric Dermatology patient handouts, there's a handout on moles and melanoma in children and teens. And it specifically says um, the ugly duckling sign is more important sign in children. Um, and that may, may talk about a suspicious mole different than all the other moles. So if a child has a hundred light brown moles that all look the same, and all of a sudden there's one red bump that doesn't match the others. If a parent notices that, bringing that to the attention of the pediatrician, and when the pediatrician or the primary care provider says, you know, this is something that we, we hear a lot, I don't know what that is, but I'm not worried about it, is to push a little harder as a parent, say, well, you know what, I might be a little bit worried about it. Do you think we could see a dermatologist? Could, could we see a pediatric dermatologist? And really pushing, and that's, you know, a lot of the kids that we've diagnosed in our practice it's actually been the parents who pushed a little bit harder for the answer, where the pediatrician might have said, you know what, maybe that's a work, maybe we'll treat it, maybe we'll just watch it. And when it didn't, you know, multiply, or there weren't other words around it, or it just wasn't improving, the parents were the one that's, ones that really pushed and asked for that specialty opinion. So I think just advocating for your child, um, that if somebody doesn't know what something is, asking for that specialty opinion, maybe pushing, not being too aggressive, but pushing for considering a biopsy if something's not going away or not adding up. Um, and then just being vigilant where, you know, you're bathing your child or teaching your child if they're too old for you to be following them into the shower. Hey, you know, if you notice a bump that doesn't look like the others, please tell mom or dad um, because that might be important for you. But I think as we discussed, the red nodule can be um, the first sign of a concerning lesion in a child more so than the multicolored nodule or the, the lesion with irregular borders or multiple colors. Not that those aren't also worrisome, but so again, just to summarize, you know, I think the pediatric dermatologists need to be educating the pediatricians and then the moms, dads, and caregivers can just be vigilant at home and make sure they continue to push and advocate when they're not getting answers. I hope that answers that question. Okay, I think we might have lost Kylie again, but I can probably um, move on to the next question that I think was for me. Um, a parent had asked with congenital moles, should those be tracked from the beginning or can parents wait until the child is one year of age? What's the best practice for these? And I think the answer to that one is probably not one size fits all. Um, just because your baby is born with a mole does not automatically mean that that mole is bad. If it's a small mole, if it's less than 15 millimeters and it's all one color, it's not rapidly growing or changing, it doesn't have multiple colors within it, I think you know, having the pediatrician photograph it and follow it closely and seeing the pediatric dermatologist when able would be fine. Um, if it were up to me, because again, I have a little bit of a selection bias, I am a pediatric dermatologist, so I personally like to see the kids, you know, early on so that I can establish my own baseline in the chart. I like to take digital photos so that if there is a change, I can really figure out exactly when that occurred. Most small and medium sized congenital moles do have a fairly low risk of developing a melanoma within them before puberty probably less than 1%. But again, one child is not the same as the other and we don't like to sort of have a cookbook approach. We like to have an individual patient approach. So even if it's as simple as establishing care with the family, getting a baseline digital photo, having a nice boring visit, I'm fine with those. 
and then educating about sun protection and about what kinds of changes to look out for that would make me want to have them call me sooner, I think can be really helpful. And then even just doing a once a year check once you've educated that family and what they're to look out for um, can really uh, be good for everyone. So it's not that it's a 911 emergency if your baby is born at the mall that you need to rush to the pediatric dermatologist that day. But I think sometime in the first year of life, making your way over there just so they can get some baseline photos. Um, and if it turns out the mole is especially large or multicolored or dark, then maybe considering going a little sooner. Um, rarely will I biopsy something that worries me in the natal, neonatal period, but I, you know, I've certainly done it. Um, and you know, I just can't stress enough that there's not sort of one approach to every child. Uh, and this is where you know, extra training and expertise comes in. And I also can't stress enough the utility of using serial digital images that are, are securely saved in that child's medical record so that if a new change does occur, we don't say, did we miss that? We can pull up last time's photo and literally put it next to this visit's photo and figure out, okay, well that happened in the last year and we know this is new. Um, and that's extremely helpful when we're trying to figure out what's going on. So Dr. Karras, just a follow-up uh, question to that. You know, with adults, you know, we have spots and we're looking to see if those spots are changing, but kids are constantly getting new spots, right? They're constantly. Yeah. And if you see something and you take your child to the pediatric dermatologist, you know, how hard should you advocate for something to be biopsied? You know, is it, is it something that you should say like, hey, this is new and it looks like you said earlier, ugly duckling, I want it biopsied. Or again, you know, as you mentioned earlier, with the whole wait and see, like, how hard should you press as a parent? Well, I think for the parent, and, and again, I like to, as a pediatric dermatologist, try to partner with the parents. You know, very seldom do I have a parent come in demanding a biopsy. What they want is my expertise. They want my opinion, you know, after looking at, you know, tens of thousands of moles in my life, um, especially using that magnifying tool called the dermatoscope. Um, I tend to have a low threshold if anything even slightly concerns me for biopsy illusion. Very rarely will I say to somebody, I am not at all worried about this, and they really push me to remove it. Um, it's usually the other way around. Having said that, if I'm not at all worried about a lesion and a parent is completely worried, and I am not able to reassure them, then I will often biopsy that lesion because as a mother, I will tell you sometimes you just have a sense. And it's not always right, but I will never try to say that I know more than a parent knows. Um, they know their child best, and if they really are insisting upon a biopsy, we can certainly talk about it and consider it. But I think um, the advocacy on the parent's part should really come in to just make sure they get to see the specialist. And hopefully, um, have that reassurance that once you're in the office of a good board certified specialist who has experience in these things, that you can feel reassured that person's taking digital images, that person's looking with their dramatoscope, they have experiences and experience with pigmented lesions, and that if they are less concerned that you can follow it closely together. Almost never do I have a parent come in to me with a lesion that they're concerned about and I tell them, A, I'm not concerned, and B, you never have to come back again. We always recommend serial re-examination so that if something's changing. And if somebody's very concerned and I'm not, maybe I won't wait a year to see them again. Maybe I'll see them in three months. And then we can show them, here's the picture from three months ago, here's today. They look identical, or maybe they don't, and we take it off. But I think, you know, having, making sure that you're seeing somebody that you're comfortable with and whose training is solid so that you can follow their opinion. That's very helpful. I think, again, you're kind of in no man's land, especially when you have a child and they're changing all the time and you're just constantly staring at them going, is that normal? Is that not normal? So I think and one thing I will add, you know, your question kind of made me think about this. In the adult world, something that's very common to ask for or to be recommended to get is total body photography. And that's not something, at least in my practice, that we've recommended because total body skin photos are really aimed at saying, okay, here are 100 moles. We want to see just mole 101. Is that new next year? Um, and the problem with that in kids is that they grow upwards, they grow outwards, they grow in all directions. 
And the mole that you might be following on day one that's on the left upper back might end up on the left lateral back by next year. And it might show up as looking new in those photographs. So I tend to use digital photography in kids to monitor an individual lesion, not to monitor groups of lesions, except in very rare cases. Because again, I think growth can really make that very confusing. Is that something you should ask for as a parent if your dermatologist is not doing it? I mean, I, I, if I were a parent, I think I would probably request it. You know, most sophisticated um, medical records have the ability of storing, storing digital images. Um, it's the rare electronic medical record nowadays that doesn't have the ability to store an image. And even if that were the case, theoretically, the parent could store the image. As a physician, I feel like I have some liability not taking images because the parents are taking images and they have it on their phone, what it looked like a year ago. And if it changes and I don't have that documented or protect myself, and I don't, you know, I don't make sure that I'm at least doing as much as they're doing, I'm not sure really, you know, what utility I am in the end. So I think, you know, the nice thing about the dermatoscope is I can photograph through it. It has a ruler in the magnifying lens and so not only does it show us the pigment pattern up close, but it also shows us the size. Um, sometimes parents will even photograph my photograph so that they have it to monitor in between our visits themselves. So if something changes, they can let me know. Um, and again, I really think like having a partnership is the way to do it. Um, and so, you know, if you have a, a physician or a provider who's just not taking photos and that's something you want, you know, request it. And um, most people are pretty open to that. That's great. And with teledermatology, I think more and more people are, are taking photos and sending yes. them to their doctor, right? Yes, and I'm a huge fan of teledermatology. And I know a lot of the people listening right now might not have a pediatric dermatologist in their community. Probability is if you don't live in a major city, you probably don't have somebody within an hour of where you live. Um, you can most likely access one of us by teledermatology. I know I have I'm licensed in like seven or eight states. Um, if I can't see you, I can connect you with somebody who is closer to you, but um, teledermatology is a huge solution that can provide a bridge in between these huge gaps in care that we have right now. There was just a paper that came out saying that there were something like eight states that had zero pediatric dermatologists. Um, that's a real problem. That's a huge problem. And I think especially for people in rural areas, Right. Where, and they're, they're kind of isolated or they'd have to travel a great distance to see a specialist. I think teledermatology is a phenomenal way for them to get exemplary care. And it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, I seldom will totally reassure somebody about a mold by teledermatology alone because I can't use that magnifying tool. But if I am worried about somebody, I will say, listen, here's, here's a... Um, a search engine that will help you find the closest board certified pediatric dermatologist near you based on your zip code. Please take this consult with you to tell them what we're worried about. Or if they don't have a pediatric dermatologist, please take my consult with you to the closest board certified adult dermatologist who I'm sure is going to take that advice um, to heart and probably take a sample if, if that's something we're worried about. So again, very good point. That's, teledermatology is a huge help, I think, and hopefully we'll be getting better and better with time. Absolutely. Well, it's a great resource for people. And I think, again, it's just something that makes the whole process easier for parents, right? If you don't have the access. So I think that's fantastic. Um, I think nowadays, we have a couple kinds of teledermatology since COVID, um, which, mm -hmm. you know, in some cases is fortunate and in some cases, you know, is unfortunate, but, um, what we have found is that the live video visits are less helpful when examining things like moles because there's a lot of motion. It's very hard to get a still image of a mole when the kids are running away from the camera. Whereas if the parent can capture a very still clear image, look at it, make sure that it's high quality and then send it securely to the dermatologist, um, that's often better. And even if we are doing a video visit, sometimes we can arrange for a still photo to be sent after just to make sure that we're getting the best exam possible. That's, that's great advice. That's really great. Cause again, a lot of this stuff is happening with, um, you know, the phone, the phone video visits. So that's, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Um, we would like people to put questions in the Q and A if you have them. Um, I'm going to ask one more question to Dr. Garris and then we'll go to the chat. 
um, because I did see a couple questions in there. So Dr. Chris, let's just talk a little bit about sunscreen. As a parent myself, when my daughter was three months old, I was told, do not put sunscreen on her, put UPF clothing and a hat. They really shouldn't be wearing sunscreen till they're, you know, eight months plus kind of thing. Um, people are worried about chemicals. What is your advice on sunscreen? I mean, obviously people are taking babies to the beach, you know, they're, they're going outside with their children. What, what is your advice on the whole sunscreen chemical debacle? I'm glad you brought that up because as a parent, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me, especially right now where we're saying the safest place to be is outside in fresh air. You're probably not going to stay inside for six months with your baby. That's just not reasonable. And so to make parents so scared about sunscreen and say, don't put any on before the age of six months, which is at one point what the American Academy of Pediatrics had recommended, I think is neither realistic nor very safe. So I think, you know, the, the more you can cover babies with physical blockers, which are either just regular clothing or ideally the UPF clothing, um, the better. But you can't cover every inch of their skin realistically. I mean, you can't cover their face, the tops of their hands. If you live in Florida, it's 90 degrees here. I mean, so I think having sort of that um, everything in moderation sense that we have about a lot of different things that, you know, you don't want to have your three-month-old baby in a bikini bathing suit at the beach from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. getting a tan, but at the same time, keeping them covered and cool. And then for the areas of the body that are still exposed, using um, sunblock with an SPF of 30 or greater. And I think just because more is known about the safety of the physical blockers, and those are the sunblocks that contain zinc or titanium dioxide, as opposed to avobenzone or oxybenzone, using the physical blockers, so zinc or titanium dioxide on babies less than six months, seems like a better idea because we're pretty sure that those do not get absorbed. They physically sit on the outside of the skin and block the sun's rays as opposed to chemically combining with the sun and reflecting the rays like the chemical sunscreens do. Um, so I think a combo of physical blockers like clothing and then on exposed areas, um, zinc or titanium dioxide based sunblocks with an SPF of 30 plus and then wide brimmed hats, shade, and again, everything in moderation. We don't want families to stay inside. Right now we need to get outside and get fresh air and you know, stay active and healthy and positive. <laughs> <laughs> and keep the parents <laughs> sane, right? Keep, keep the parents sane and all of exactly. that. Get outside. <laughs> it's true, it's not good for the kids if the parents are going crazy stuck inside. So everybody so needs to look for her. So that's the more the mineral based. So when people go out to the stores, it's more the mm -hmm. mineral based sunscreen. Exactly, and be careful. It's really interesting to me. Some of the sunscreens out there, when I'm shopping for labels, I'll say, oh great, it's got titanium dioxide and I reach for it, but then it'll say ingredient two, avobenzone. So some of them have both physical and chemical blockers. For babies, if you can, I'd probably just stick with the physical blockers. So anything that ends in oxide, so titanium or zinc dioxide um, or zinc oxide are probably the best. Whereas anything that ends in benzone is more of a chemical. So avobenzone or oxybenzone are probably ones to stay away from in, in little babies. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we are gonna go to the chat now. This first question, I'm gonna direct more towards Dr. Papo and Dr. Sondak. Um, this is from Sandy, one of our parents. She wants to know what options are available for pediatric patients at stage 2B or 2C. Um, Dr. Papa, why don't I start with you for that question? So to my knowledge, there are no pediatric clinical trials that are currently examining the role of adjuvant. That means that therapies after complete resection of a melanoma that are 2B or 2C that have not spread to the nodes. I know that the adults are currently doing clinical trials for that subset of patients but to my knowledge, there are no clinical trials available for children. And to my knowledge, the data in adults for advanced stage two are not out yet. So I, to my, I would still recommend just surgical resection, sentinel node in selected cases and observation, 
but I would be very intrigued to know what Dr. Sandak knows about the current ongoing adult trials, if there is any preliminary data to suggest that adjuvant uh, immunotherapy might be a benefit in this patient. So thank you, Alberto. In fact, there isn't any. The trials are ongoing, and I don't believe we'll hear any information in adults for several years about whether doing anything besides surgery is useful. But a few key points. Number one, you mentioned stage 2B and 2C. That means a thicker melanoma, possibly ulcerated if it's a 2C. And um, it, it, these cases, if it is truly melanoma, not one of these, we're not sure what it is. Could it, it's atypical, we're not certain. But no, if it is a sure melanoma, and probably even if they're not certain it's not melanoma, a sentinel lymph node biopsy is important. We would never fully stage the patient without knowing whether they had sentinel lymph node metastases and uh, with a thick tumor. Um, but the good news is, in our hands and uh, across the board, if you have a negative sentinel node with a thick melanoma, in adults, the prognosis is still pretty good. There's, there's a 20 to 25% chance of the melanoma coming back despite the sentinel node being negative. In children, our experience is that they are much better than that, that, they, that almost never do they have a, um, a recurrence, not never, but they're much less likely to, re to develop widespread disease if it isn't in the lymph nodes. Now we've seen some cases where the sentinel node was not done or was inaccurate, and the patient came back with a lymph node that was enlarged, and that's the top thing that we would be looking for in a stage two melanoma patient of any age. Did, they, did we miss something? And if a lymph node becomes enlarged, get it checked out. Because now if that is the case, it's stage three, and it's clear more treatment would be needed. For now, I would not ever recommend for a child with stage two melanoma to have additional treatment, just a, a good surgery and a sentinel node biopsy in, in just about every case. And a good pathology review, like Dr. Sandag was saying, because Spitz melanoma versus a true melanoma might change also how often you, you monitor this. So I agree 100%. Absolutely. Great, thank you both so much. Um, we have one more question from our viewers and this really touches on genetics. Um, we get this question quite often at the MRF, so I'd love to get all of your opinions on this. So if you, you know, now an adult had pediatric melanoma, how worried should you be that you could pass that on to your own child one day? Is that, is that a concern? And if so, you know, should your child be checked more regularly? What are your thoughts on that? Um, we can start with Dr. Garris to begin. I do think that that's a concern if there is um, a maternal melanoma during pregnancy um, that could cells possibly pass to the baby. That's very rare, but um, certainly having a pediatric dermatologist follow that baby from day one will be an important thing. I don't know if the oncologists have any comments on that about how common it is. That's something I've never personally seen. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, so transplacental transmission of melanoma has been uh, has been documented, and um, it's usually early after birth when you see that. But I, I agree that they need to be monitored. There's very really well good guidelines on what to do, and if you need to do scans or if you need to do only uh, uh, skin exams, because some of this the presentation of the melanoma will be metastatic disease at the time of initial presentation. So it's really not clear. In the absence of melanoma during pregnancy, if a parent has had melanoma and then has a child, I am not aware of any very strong data to suggest that there is a very high increased risk of having melanoma in the offspring. However, if there is a strong family history and there's specific guidelines on when to test for familial melanoma, if it's two or three members, you know, on the family that have had melanoma, or if there's a history of, for example, pancreatic cancer in association with melanoma, then, and you have a child that has, develops melanoma, then there is some, you should be a little bit more uh, careful as far as uh, 
screening for, for this disease. Um, but is there a direct relationship between, let's say, a 35-year-old mother that had melanoma and gets pregnant to have a child that has a risk for melanoma? I am not aware that there's a very high increased risk of that. I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts or, or comments or suggestions. Dr. Sondek, anything you want to add to that? Yes, I do. I, I, I agree with what was said. I want to emphasize if you have a, a mother is actually pregnant when she has melanoma or gets pregnant after being treated with melanoma, then there is reason to watch mom carefully and check the baby. We check the placenta after delivery in all of our pregnant women who have melanoma. And that is something that can be done and is very helpful in making sure that there is not really any reason to be concerned. It can be very reassuring that there was no problem with that uh, child. But this is a different question than, is there something inherited that the child has a higher risk when they get to be five or six or 10 years old? I can say that in all the children that I've ever taken care of with melanoma, I've never once had mom or dad say, and you know, when I was 10, I had melanoma also. So it is, so childhood melanoma survivors, I've had them grow up and have kids and the kids have been fine. Um, but what I do think, what I tell everybody is there are a lot of things that are the same about everybody in the family. I'll, if, if everybody has red hair or blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin, burns easily. If mom and dad are like that, the kids are probably like that. The sun is not going to be good for them. Uh, the sun isn't good for any of us, but it's especially bad if we don't have as much protection. If the, everybody in the, if mom and dad like to go out on the boat in the middle of the summer, the kids are probably on the boat too. So lots of things go along in the family that aren't genetic per se, but indicate that you're at risk because you're out in the sun a lot and your skin isn't that protective. So when anybody in the family has had melanoma, everyone in the family should be concerned with protecting themselves from the sun. They probably have shared factors, even if they are not just at the gene level that make the whole family susceptible to the damaging effects of ultraviolet rays. Great, thank you, Dr. Sondak. That, that placenta fact is really fascinating. Um, just one follow-up question on that. Is that something, you know, as a pregnant mother, do you talk to your OB about that? Do you talk to your oncologist? Like, who do you address that with so that when you do so, give birth, yes. that can be so discussed? Any, any woman with a history of melanoma who gets pregnant should share that information. Their obstetrician should know about that. If the obstetrician says, boy, I don't know about what to do, they should contact their oncologist. We ask any of our patients who we've ever taken care of, if they get pregnant later on, call us up. We don't want them getting CAT scans and PET scans during their pregnancy because that could lead to radiation exposure for the child. But we want to keep an eye on them, monitor their moles, and arrange for the um, the placenta check. We actually have a little handout that we give to our pregnant patients and we and one page of it is for their obstetrician so that they can um, explain what we want done with the placenta and if they can't do it, they can send it back to us. Every once in a while we've had a patient who says, well, I'm giving birth at home. And we say, well, you get out the Tupperware, put the placenta in and have somebody bring it into the hospital the very next day after the baby's born and we'll look at it. And uh, so it is something that is, is very helpful because the pathologist, if they know what they're doing, can look very carefully at the placenta. They can see the different parts. There's placenta has two parts, the mom's part and the baby's part. And you can actually tell even if there is uh, whether there's anything in either part or both parts, 
But if we did see melanoma in that placenta and it had gotten into the fetal part, the baby's part, that would be a child who was at risk of getting melanoma in the first year of their life. And we would watch them very, very closely with the pediatricians. Unfortunately, yeah. super, super, super yeah. rare. I think the last time it happened in the United States was like uh, oh, oh, about 10 years ago. I can't remember. Addison and Addison's Army. You can look them up on the web. That's the last case in the United States that I know of. It's extremely rare. Yeah. Great, great, in, great information though. I think, you know, as when you're pregnant, you have a lot of anxiety anyway. So to, to know that you could check that off the list and, and have that evaluated, I think is, is really great information. So thank you so much for that. Um, we are going to wrap up now. And again, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists for joining us. If there are additional questions, you can email the MRF at education at melanoma.org. And again, this will be recorded and posted on the MRF website under our patient and caregiver section. Um, again, there's the link right there. You can see this recorded section later. And we look forward to a really exciting day to wrap up Melano uh, Pediatric Melanoma Awareness Month tomorrow. We have three great sessions at 10 a.m. We have a live Q&A with Dr. Michael Roth from MD Anderson, um, focused on our adolescent young adult population. At 5 p.m. Central Time, we have the Glow in the Dark Bingo. Super fun for all ages. And lastly, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central, we have a parent networking session. Many of you find that these uh, sessions are so fabulous to connect with each other. So that's what that's really for. Um, so again, I would like to just say a big thank you to Dr. Papo, Dr. Garris, and Dr. Sondak for their time. And uh, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. And we can't wait till we can see you all in person next yes. year. Absolutely. Thank you all. Bye.